Well, hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We're live from Manu Yusuf, Atante Sawekanda. Also live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSFA Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Coming up tonight, the Ghana Bar Association takes exception to the comments made by the National Democratic Congress 2024 presidential candidate and former president John Dramani Mahama to the effect that the courts have become partisan. The NDC believes that pres the former president reflected exactly what the situation is. We're getting to that. Also, more revelations as more witnesses appear before the bipartisan parliamentary committee probing the leaked tape purported to be a plot to remove the Inspector General of Police. We hear from Superintendent George Asari, who took his turn today, as well as a security analyst. Stay with us here on Ghana Tonight. And also, the minority members of parliament have postponed their planned Occupy Bank of Ghana demonstration slated for Tuesday. That's tomorrow. But they are insisted on using the same route that have become the subject of the dispute. Does that mean that really what the outcome of the court injunction case would not have any significant impact on the decision stay with us mama yarga is our guest is going to be joining us later on the show here on gonna tonight as always we're very interactive let's hear from you the hashtag we're using is gonna tonight on facebook and twitter let's get talking let's settle for gonna breach Attorney General and Minister of Justice Godfred Yeboadami says he will ensure justice for aggrieved customers of defunct gold trading firm Men's Gold following criminal prosecution against former CEO Nanapia Mensa, known as Namwan. He was speaking at the 40th International Symposium on Economic Crime in USA. The International Monetary Fund has underscored the need for developing countries to trade amongst themselves in their local currencies as a means of strengthening their economies. According to the IMF Managing Director, Kristalina Georgieva, her outfit is working with member countries to also raise funds locally through the bonds market. Uh, we also work with countries to help them build local bond markets so they can mobilize uh, financing in local uh, currency to invest in their development. The needs uh, for development finance are enormous. Uh, having more institutions that can specialize in particular region or in financing on particular topics uh, is good for the developing uh, world. The minority in parliament has rescheduled its planned protest March calling for the resignation of Bank of Ghana Governor and its deputies to Tuesday, September 12. In a statement signed by Minority Leader Dr. Kesolata Singh, the group noted that the change in date is because of an adjournment by an Accra High Court to rule on their objection to the injunction suit by the Ghana Police Service. They further maintained that the earlier route communicated remains the same. But the police have indicated that the route defies public order and will breach security. After the court hearing early in the day, the Baku Central Member of Parliament, Mahama Yariga, insisted the minority had not been stopped from the demonstration in spite of adjourning the ruling on the preliminary objection to counter the injunction suit by the police against the protest. As law-abiding citizens, we don't want to sidestep the, the, the courts because we need them to protect us also one day. So the courts have not stopped us from demonstrating. Yes. And the courts have not changed the route of the demonstration. And we have no intention to change the route of the demonstration. Indeed, the, the arguments on the route hasn't even happened yet in court. It is just our pointing out that the police is incompetent yeah in the way that they have come to court. The bipartisan parliamentary probe on the alleged plot to oust the Inspector General of Police 
has acquired another version of the leaked tip with additional information has emerged. Chairman of the committee, Samuel Atachia, who gave the hint, indicated that the committee would have to study the new tip. Superintendent George Asari appeared before the committee at today's sitting. We've had the benefit of a tip on the assumption that it's authentic. The members of the committee will have to internalize that tip and it is also transcribed and look at it. And that will give us the ideas as to what to do. First of all, do we bring all the I mean, stakeholders together with their lawyers for cross-examination and uh, cross-firing to take place? Whilst we listen attentively and later after, when they finish, then we'll have our turn. Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, more revelations as more of the witnesses are appearing before the bipartisan parliamentary committee probing the leaked tape that captures a plot to have the president remove the IJP. It's taking very interesting turns. We hear from Superintendent George Asari, who took his turn today, as well as a security analyst on the developments earlier today. And uh, as we, we did here... Uh, from the chair of the committee, Samuel Atacha, there's a new audio which he describes as very extensive, it's, and much more inclusive. We had more than 45 minutes because this initial one that the committee has and has transcribed is for about 45 minutes long. What we are hearing is that this other audio that they have is more than 45 minutes. So it's, it paints a very interesting development. So one of the police officers at the center of this IGP-linked audio tape controversy, Superintendent George Asari, has labeled parts of the tape in question as cut and paste, as in edited. This was at the Bipartisan Parliamentary Committee hearing earlier today uh, when he appeared before them. He, however, confirmed that his voice was on the audio tape. Yeah, that's his voice. Take a look. Do you admit that your voice is on the tape? Yes, Mr. Chair. But there is some cut and paste on the audio. But that notwithstanding, the voice in it is mine. I have a large book in on tape. Everything he came to say here on video in his office, the same office. His relationship with IGP and contracts, 40,000 boots contracts. My brother, my brother, but you were very good and said you speak in camera. Have you forgotten yourself? I, I, uh, yes. Ask your very simple question. Chair, sorry. When I will appear sorry. before the. Honorable chair, sorry. Okay. Honorable chair, I'm, I'm... All right. Well, so uh, Samuel Atacha had to stop him there, that superintendent, sorry, because he was saying some things that, according to Atacha, had to be said in camera, as in not in the public domain. So the, the committee has agreed that there's a lot of outstanding issues which have to be said in camera, that is, off the cameras. So that is one thing as well that, that would lead to a lot of development. But I want to take a listen to Samuel Atachia telling the press after today's sitting that the committee has a new tape, which he describes as more comprehensive. Take a look. You've had the benefit of a tape on the assumption that it's authentic. The members of the committee will have to internalize that tape and it is also transcribed and look at it. And that will give us the ideas as to what to do. First of all, do we bring all the I mean, stakeholders together with their lawyers for cross-examination and uh, cross-firing to take place? Whilst we listen attentively and later, after, when they finish, then we'll have our turn. 
Well, so that's some I'll touch on there. A new development is Ken Ofeso Sabaji retired. He's a security analyst. Thank you, Ken Ofeso Sabaji, for joining us here on Ghana tonight. So, very interesting development we're seeing now in, in this uh, committee hearings. After today, uh, Superintendent Asari appearing before them, the committee says they have a new video and audio as well, which is described as quite comprehensive. To take on all of this. Well, if I recall very well, when this leaked audio tape came out, I listened to certain individuals on certain platforms, that's media houses platforms, reporting that there were video files beyond or besides the audio file. And that the video files were a bit more extensive or expansive in the coverage of the meetings. So I'm not surprised that it has now come to the attention of the committee that such a video file or audio file exists. Indeed, I had the privilege of listening to the superintendent um, Asari today. And I think he kept insisting that the audio file upon which the transcript was made had certain missing elements. So the whole idea is I want to get to the bottom of this um, uh, conspiracy. So the more, the better. And I think the earlier the committee had access to uh, the video file, digested it, did the transcript, shared it with the witnesses, and if need be, recall them uh, to appear before the committee, the better. But I say, Alfred, we need to look beyond the exchanges before the committee and try and understand what, what is really going on. And what is going on is, is very simple. One is that there has been an extensive politicization of our security institutions. And in this case, we're talking about the Ghana Police Service. That we need to admit because I wasn't in the country, but I've been told that the second witness, the COP who appeared, was not ashamed about owning up that he is an MPP uh, sympathizer or affiliate or whatever it is. And we all know, when this gentleman on the committee, the chief superintendent or superintendent Tobu or ACP Tobu was about to leave. He tendered his resignation. And then he indicated that he was going to go into politics. Some Ghanaians tore him into shreds, especially those whose party is now in government. That he had been an NDC officer all along and yet was very close to the IGP and so on and so forth. See, this time around, the very people who were castigating Tobu for coming out that he did not practice politics whilst he was in uniform, he served his service and his country, but he was leaving to go into politics. Those people who castigated him are now very quiet. And this is a very bad case Worse than, you know, uh, Peter Tobu's uh, case, assuming that what he did was wrong. We need to hear those people. But all I'm saying is that the degree of politicization is worrisome. So now you need to put a label on your forehead that you are a police officer, but you are NDC police and MPP police. That's the first thing. The second thing is a lesson or an idea I learned from one of the army commanders I served under, or had the honor of serving under, Lieutenant General Smith. And he used to tell us that 
The business of a commander among others as a leader is to create a command environment in which your headquarters, your staff, and the units that the headquarters command can do their work with little or no supervision. Now, this command climate or command environment is what we are talking about here. That it starts from the political level. Because if we had a political system in which Ghanaians knew that you couldn't go to a certain minister, you couldn't go to a certain president, you couldn't go to any chief director mm -hmm. in order to peddle, you know, falsehoods and so on, people will be very, very hesitant in approaching those individuals in order to peddle, you know, uh, influence or solicit, uh, you know, assistance. But because the system has become such that the system makes use of persons like those who have appeared before the committee in order to get their yeah. control over uh, these institutions. That is why people have the courage, you know, the nerve to actually conspire to remove no, an IGP. An IGP. And it's very, very worrisome. What when is... they appear before the committee and they acknowledge that they know that the constitution prescribes that the president shall this and that and that yeah. appoint an IGP. Worrisome indeed, um, no, no. Ken of Fessus about you. It is worrisome. And, but one thing that also is consistent with uh, COP, that's uh, Alex Mensa, and then also the superintendent Asari, who appeared before the committee today, is about the performance of the IGP. So you recall COP, uh, Alex Mensa, talking about the IGP being the worst that he has encountered over the 31 years that he's been serving as a police officer. And then also superintendent Asari talks about some people in the service not being happy about how the IGP is going about things in the service. How? Do you measure the performance of an IGP? I mean, what's the criteria? I mean, you've served in the army, right? But then again, with the knowledge of measurement of the criteria of the head of a security institution, what should that be? I might have my disagreements with the IGP around questions of his style. Not that the IGP is corrupt. He's not embezzled police funds. He has not misapplied the resources that have been given to him. It is all about, you know, very little things like welfare and whatever it is. You see what I mean? So are they really professional police officers? We've all worked under different commanders from the time that we were second lieutenants. There were some that we liked. There were some that we didn't hate, but we're not very comfortable with their style of leadership but we did not conspire to talk to higher levels, whether it's a brigade level at the time, or if you like the army HQ level at the time and CDS's officers to have them removed. We didn't do that. We did what we could to serve our term or tenure under their leadership and then we left. That is how professional officers behave. We must not expect that everyone who becomes our leader will be somebody that we like. It doesn't work that way. And the fault that I have with these police officers who have been making so much noise, mm -hmm. you know, it's all part of the propaganda to try and undermine the integrity of the IGP. He's harsh, he's this, he's that, he's selective, he's nepotistic, he promotes his people, he, did this, he does that. So the question that was asked today to Superintendent Asari, that should this responsibility, may we call it the dereliction of oversight responsibility right. of the police council. Because it's a police council together with the Ministry of Interior, Interior who are responsible for assessing the performance of the IGP. Right. And that raises the concern about what the police council's own measure is, and then also the other agencies that assess the performance of the IGP, uh, for that matter. But there's, you know, before we go, there's one bit about um, how he, Superintendent Asari, uh, together with Bugin Abu's son, who is described as 
their personal prophet, because Bulvin Abu's son is a prophet, who is a personal prophet of Sopitan Asari. And he came into the picture somehow about something to do with, uh, you know, spiritual powers and so on. I want to take a listen to that part and then can I, I'll bring you in on, on that particular issue. Take a look. It was Alaji. Master knows he is a Christian. And he was well aware that he will resort to his Christ Christian prayers. But in, that, in addition to that, Chief Bugri Nabu wanted him to as well uh, allow him to consult uh, some uh, uh, malams for him. Some malams for him. And that was why I said, Alaji, this one here, it is your job, so no problem. You can, you, you, you can do it if you can help. You mentioned places or imams. Which one? Honorable Chair, I was using them interchangeably. The malams and the imams, you are the same people. Well, so, can I first about you? This is it. So, in one breath, this is the Bugin Abusan, who is a personal prophet of Superintendent Asari, we just saw. And then some bit about Bugin Abu suggesting that they have to go and see some three malams speak because he knows what, how, what they can do to help them to get their choice to become an IGP. All of this, Kenel. Machinations or machinations, you know, trying to send names. I remember we've heard some of these names before, long ago. Yes. We heard those names where people were projecting as part of propaganda that so and so will be the next IGP. Meanwhile, you are not in the seat that is responsible for appointing IGPs. It means that we are not using professional calculations to appoint the IGP. We are using political calculations, you know, about how a police officer can help a party that he is affiliated to, to win elections. And maybe he gets promoted as IGP or becomes a commissioner and so on and so forth. Did we join the army or join the police or for that matter, any other security institution, you know, to, to do this kind of work. You do your professional work. Then you support the government, and you support the institutions, and then you support the state. That is how it works. Mm -hmm. Not to buy, you know, what we call eye service, boot licking. Did the IGP, the IGP go to see uh, Bugri Nabu that please call these officers and interview them? And this is one idea that I have, that the IGP has outsmarted them. They were the ones who orchestrated the conspiracy. Not knowing that the IGP or Bugri Nabu is also close to the IGP. So when the IGP was told, as we say, where is the evidence? The evidence, as Bugri Nabu said, is in the audio tape, is in the video. So they agreed, assuming that that narrative is correct. Because the IGP hasn't come to admit that he actually orchestrated the recording. But if he did that, where do you find fault with him? Because you were the ones who, in the first instance, were conspiring to remove him. And if you chose to find the evidence, you come and appear before parliament, and you have this, you know, uh, angry, whatever, Ambience, you're angry with the IGP for recording. You are not ashamed that you conspired to unseat the IGP. So if there's a kind of mentality, the psychology of Ghanaians and of the people that were placed in these services, then we are doomed. And we shouldn't be surprised that we are seeing some of these things that are happening around us. The lack of moral courage to tell somebody that, look, you are my leader, mm -hmm. you are my commander. Right. But what you are telling me, I cannot do. And if you lie, you are like me. You say, I will not do it. Do it. Ghana Professor Sabaji, appreciate your time. Thank you very much uh, for your thoughts here on Ghana tonight. And uh, this matter is not seeing the end anytime soon. If what the committee is saying is anything to go by, that they have a new audio which is even extensive than the 45 minutes that they have been dealing with.
over the period. Security analyst Kenneth Fusawaji retired. Thank you for your time. Coming up next here on Ghana Tonight, the Ghana Bar Association is taking exception to comments made by the former president, flag bearer of the NDC into the 2024 general elections, John Mahama, to the effect that the courts have become partisan. Well, exactly what is the issue of, um, of the Ghana Bar Association? But first of all, I want to take a, take a look at this. It, this is what specifically the former president and the NDC flag bearer for the 2024 general elections, John Mahama, described the current composition of the judiciary as NPP-inclined judges. He was speaking at the third annual lawyers' conference of the NDC lawyers in Akonsombo via a link. Take a look. We do believe that there must be judicial reform. Indeed, most Ghanaians, if you interview most Ghanaians, they believe that there must be some reform of the judiciary in order to bolster its reputation and make it an independent institution that not only Ghanaians, but foreign investors and any person who is in the jurisdiction of Ghana can trust. And so as part of the discussions you have, we must look at how we as the executive and also the members of the judiciary can work together to improve the image of the Ghanaian judiciary. I believe that if the image of the judiciary is improved, it inures to the benefit of those who work in the courts. It inures to the benefit of the judges and all the judicial service workers. And so this must be something that the executive cannot impose on the judiciary, but the judiciary and the executive working together, you know, can work to improve the stature of the judiciary. We have our work cut out for us when it comes to the executive. We must make sure that we restore the trust of our people in the executive and that people are not going to come to, into office and money is going to be found under their bed. And at least I can guarantee and uh, assure the nation that I'm not going to be a clearing agent president and that if people are accused of corruption, we would allow the constitutional bodies that are mandated to deal with those issues to go ahead and do their work and carry out those investigations. And so um, that I can uh, give a firm assurance about. And um, let me also say that often when we have come out of elections and we have won, everybody wants to go into the executive. Our lawyers, please, I beg you, some of you must be prepared to go onto the bench. And um, I know that some have very lucrative legal practices. They don't want to leave those practices and go on the bench. But I mean, you can see what the, uh, the current president has done. He's appointed the largest number, biggest number of judges onto the bench. It's more than 80 towards 100 and counting. He's packed the courts. And we know that they've packed the courts because they want to avoid accountability after they have left office. And so all manner of people who are known to have been partisan, to have been executives of their party, who are in the legal profession, are being um, um, leapfrogged into the superior courts and other places. And so we must be prepared as NDC uh, legal persons to also uh, go onto the bench so that we can balance out, you know, uh, the judiciary. Currently, the judiciary is packed with NPP um, um, inclined uh, judges. Well, so that's the comprehensive concern that, that the former president, John Mahama, raised. Now, this will not be the first time he's raised those concerns about the judiciary. Last year, around August last year, at the same event, he criticized the judiciary and the reason why he believes that the reforms in the judiciary have to come in as quickly as possible to restore confidence, especially in that arm of government. Recently, so badly has the image of our judiciary deteriorated that many of our citizens openly make mockery of our justice system and of our justices. The phrase, go to court, is these days met with derisive laughter instead of hope that one would truly get justice if he went to the courts. 
If people are not poking fun about politics and inducements being used to sway the hand of justice in the lower courts, then it is poking fun and making statements about the 7-0 of the unanimous FC. Verdicts which mostly involve cases of a political nature in our Supreme Court. This is an unfortunate but serious development. One of the scariest existential threats to any democracy is when citizens think their judiciary holds no value for them or no use to them. And in recent time, we've seen surveys uh, by both the Afrobarometer and then also the United Nations ranking institutions that are perceived to be corrupt or have actually engaged in corruption. And you find the judiciary in there and so on. That's where the concern has been raised. Sevia Kuje is the public relations officer of the Ghana Bar Association. Is joining me on Zoom. Mr. Kuje, thank you very much uh, for joining us here on Ghana tonight. So what exactly is the Ghana Bar Association's concern about the comprehensive issues that John Mahama raised in that video I just played? This is a, con a, con a comment that must be condemned, especially coming from uh, a high caliber person uh, such as uh, uh, former President Mahama. I don't know how he uh, uh, came to the conclusion that uh, judges that have been appointed or have been appointed by the current president uh, MPP inclined. He was once a, a president. Maybe he has some evidence that I do not have. But I think in making allegations of this nature, uh, he should have been able to substantiate it by mentioning names, at least. Uh, he, he said there were 80 people. So he's able to mention at least 10 of them or just a certain number of them. Uh, that would have been fine. But I must also admit that there's nothing wrong for him to advise any group of people especially lawyers who have identified themselves as uh, NDC lawyers, to make a career on the bench. That is absolutely good advice. But to say that uh, they should do that because he wants a balance on the bench because his uh, allegation is that the current crop of judges that have been appointed or have been appointed by the current, current president are uh, uh, MPP inclined. It's, it's rather uh, in bad taste uh, because um, this is the man who is seeking the high office of president? Is he telling us that that's what he's coming to do? Because in his comment, he said um, there's a need to reform. Is he coming to reform by perpetuating the same complaint about? Then to me, he will not be doing any reform. He would rather be continuing with the alleged rot. And uh, so I think that uh, there are people we look up to. We aspire to be like them some, uh, one, uh, one day. Personally, he's somebody I've been following closely since my university days as a younger person when he was in parliament. So some of these things, I think that I should be careful. He should just stop saying them because he's a man of influence, an ex-president, a former president, who is a, a, the leader of a party, a flag bearer. He holds a lot of influence, has a lot of followers, so not a, a good thing for him to say. I, and to I, say I uh, that be a person of integrity, a person of moral uprightness, and a person of uh, good knowledge of the law. I don't know of a situation where they have ever asked anybody, or in the future they will ask anybody, what is your political ideology, political affiliation, <clears throat> membership of a political party before you are appointed? I've not heard it before. I think there are people on the bench now who, or at least one judge, who is a former parliament, a, parliament, a member of parliament on the ticket of the NDC. Nobody prevented him of become, uh, from becoming a judge because he was once in politics, because he was purely appointed on his professional competence and qualification, not his political affiliation or uh, political membership of the party. But you do also agree, uh, Mr. Koje, th that even beyond the former president, other surveys like the Afrobarometer and others have captured the perception that respondents have about the judiciary and the fact that reforms have to be taken or implemented to address the mistrust for that arm of government, the judiciary. So if you agree that some reforms have to be undertaken to address this particular issue, 
is the former president not just reflecting the views and concerns that people have captured in some of these surveys, which I'm sure the GBA is aware of? If there should be any reform, it shouldn't be reform along political lines. Because what I know is that as a judge, you are appointed, you're taking an oath. If a matter comes before you, you don't ask the parties, which party do you belong to? Where do you come from? Who is your father? Those things do not arise unless those are some of the facts that are pleaded in court and questions, evidence must be led in respect of that. If you go to court, whatever is sent to court are allegations. You have to lead credible and cogent evidence in support of those allegations. Based on the evidence you have led, the judge will then apply the evidence and the law to the facts. Those are the allegations before the court and then come to a conclusion. Right. So you may be telling the truth, but if the truth does not coincide with the evidence you have left, you may lose the case. Okay. So let us understand these processes. Mr. Mama at least have gone to, through, through a petition, a election petitions. He won one. He lost one. And I don't see why these things should be a problem. I don't expect any reasonable person to go to court and say that I must win. You may only win because... Winning depends on a lot of factors. As I said, your pleadings, <clears throat> that is the uh, allegations you've made, which must be supported. Okay. You, can, you must substantiate those allegations with credible and positive evidence. Okay. And it must be situated in the law by the judge to be able to rule for you. If you well, fail to do those, too bad for you. Well, stay with me, Mr. Koje, uh, counsel. Let me welcome Felix Kwachiofosu, he's a former Deputy Communications Minister and the spokesperson for uh, John Mohammed's 2024 uh, campaign ahead of the 2024 general elections. I uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kwachiofosu, for joining us here on Ghana tonight. This is the Ghana Bar Association. You just heard him saying that they take exception to the former president's continuous criticism of the judiciary. He must stop doing that because he's a man of influence. Well, the only thing we should be taking exception to is the Ghana Bar Association selectivity and their pension to jump into action only when the NDC speaks. That is what they've been doing lately. You know, in the past, when I was growing up, it was a highly respected institution that spoke true to power and was willing and able to take on governments and other institutions that were engaged in, in clear wrongdoing. But these days, they don't do that anymore. All they do is to wait for the NDC to express a concern or the other about the judicial system and they rally to the defense of the judiciary or sometimes the government uh, what you have these days is that they hold bar conferences they invite the president the attorney general who often sees that platform to launch attacks on the person of the former president or the ndc so that is the only thing that should be condemned here otherwise any reasonable fair-minded person will find reason and value in what the former president is saying. Let me also put it on record that President Mama is not an unreasonable person. He has not said these things or taken this position because he lost the court case in the election petition. As he rightly pointed out, President Mama won the election petition in 2013. And no reasonable person forms an opinion about the judicial system on the basis of the winning or losing of one case. What we have observed is a consistent pattern of appointment of persons that we know have MPP leanings. We have also observed a consistent pattern of bizarre rulings, especially in political cases that the NDC or the MPP has interest. And you see, President Mama has not just woken up from a slumber and gone to town and made these pronouncements. Why? The gentleman, because unfortunately, I do not, I did not catch his name, so pardon me. Well, yes, he, he says, he says yes. if you have evidence, you should mention names of right. these judges right. who lean towards the MPP. I have never shrunk, look, I have never shrunk from mentioning names. Indeed, I don't want to mention names so that it does not appear as if I'm sending out to the people I'm about to mention. But since you ask, I'll provide you with proof. Look, we have a tall list. That's what the GB is asking for. Mm -hmm. Of persons we know have MPP lineage. Indeed, when I finish speaking to you, I will forward to you evidence of their MPP membership and affiliation. If you go to the High Court today, there is a judge called Justice Solomon Tumesi. He was an MPP communicator. Indeed, I will send you a video of him sitting in an FM station in Kumasi, debating on behalf of the MPP. In addition to that, he became the constituency chairman 
of the Doma East constituency of the new Patriotic Party. Again, I will send you screenshots and Facebook posts of Justice Eric Ansa and Kuma, who is also a high court judge, making clearly partisan statements in support of President Akufuado. Why? When Justice Gawu, I hope I got the name right, who was recently appointed as a Supreme Court judge, went to the Parliamentary Committee for Betting, did he not openly admit to his MPP affiliation? And there are many more that I could mention. What I expect the GBA to do is to assess the concerns being expressed by President Mahama and fight to ensure that the review of justice is balanced and that there is equity and there is fairness. Why? Uh, uh, what do you call it? Were we not in this country? When the Muntia three, four gentlemen, mm -hmm. deemed to be affiliated to the NDC, made unsavory comments about some judges, were they not promptly sentenced to four months prison sentence? Were we also not in, in this country when Telegapon made similar statements about the judiciary and the judge? Did he not walk away with a slap on the wrist? Why the disparity in treatment? How is it that if it is an NDC person, they get such a harsh punishment, but an NDP person gets a slap on the wrist? Why? This birth certificate ruling that was done by the courts. Is it not bizarre? How can we be told that in a matter that the MPP and the MP NDC have interest, a document on which the parents of someone who has been born right. has been captured, the names have been captured, where they come from has been captured. We are told that that document cannot tell you where the person who is born comes from, and that you cannot determine whether he's a Ghanaian or not by looking at the birth certificate. When the whole world knows that that is the document that is used, but the NDC had an interest, the MPP had an interest, and we know how that went. I could go on and cite a tall list of cases, but not, not the GBA pretend that they don't see these things. And then when the NDC complains, it is because we want to run down the judiciary. Why? I see. When the MPP lost, I your pardon, when the MPP lost the election petition in 2013, mm -hmm. did we not hear what WSA Say uh, John, as uh, Lo and all of them said, did they not accuse the Asantini of brokering some bribes given to the Supreme Court judges? Where was the GBA in that instance? Did they jump to the defense of the judiciary at that time? How is it that when the MPP speaks, they are mum? Why? When when some MPP rascals vandalized a court in Kumasi, what punishment right. did those people receive? Yes, people who sat on radio and disparaged judges were sentenced to four months imprisonment. You see, we need to be fair and balanced. And I need to place on record mm -hmm. that Pre President Mama is not reckless. He is not unreasonable. He has spoken the truth which we all know in this country. So he says that NDC lawyers should take an interest in training to become judges so that they can also go on to the next. Because one of the ways that you balance such a lopsided arrangement is to ensure that members of the other party also are in there. Maybe at that point, we will come to the realization. So, that so that's that's the concern that they raise. That, that if if that's that's an issue that this administration has put a lot of judges uh, that are that have leaning, lineage or the, the the linkage or leaning, so beg your pardon, with the MPP, will the correction of it be the NDC, as John Mahama said, also having a lot more of the judges who are who have leanings to the NDC also on the bench. <laughs> First of all, how is it that there is no concern about the dominance of the MPP poll in the judiciary? How come people are not? How come the GBA is not concerned about that? They even deny that that is the case. Number two, if you have a preponderance of MPP judges in the judiciary, how do you balance it? You don't balance it by sending neutral people there. You balance it by sending NDC people there. But you see, it is not the ideal case. You understand me? So it is a cautionary tale to all of us on how we need to demand balance. The mm -hmm. overwhelming appointment of MPP people has gotten to a point where it is not tolerable. And I think that the GBA must wake up to that realization and, and agree that the right things must be done. President okay. Kukwado has simply abused, uh, let me learn, please, he has abused the power given to him to do these appointments. Why? We were in this country. We woke up one day and a certain doctor appeared in a known MPP communicator and activist was appointed to become the chair, sorry, a commissioner at the Electoral Commission. When well, mm -hmm. we know that this is a body that is supposed to organize elections in which multiple parties have interest. How do you select okay. one person from one political party to go and become a referee in a contest that is going to be held among political parties? So these are concerns that are legitimate. That nobody should trivialize it and attempt to browbeat the NDC into accepting what we know is not acceptable.
Okay. Felix Kwachofoso, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for, for joining us here on Ghana tonight. And uh, to you as well, uh, thank you very much. Xavier Kuje Council uh, is uh, the spokesperson for the Ghana Bar Association. I'm going to go for this quick break. When I come back, we'll get into the next issue, uh, which has to do with the minority and uh, the planned protest march to have the Bank of Ghana governor and his two deputies resign. It was supposed to take place tomorrow. There's a development. It has been postponed because of an earlier development in court today. Stay with us. We'll be back shortly. Mama Yariga will be joining us after this quick break. This is Ghana Tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to demonstrate to you the superior properties of Flamingo paint as compared to other paint brands on the market. We take equal quantities of Flamingo paint and this ordinary paint. We then dilute them with water. And now, let the test begin. The gentleman on the left is going to apply the ordinary paint and the gentleman on my right will use the Flamingo superior paint. As you can clearly see, Flamingo has the obvious better hiding. Furthermore, Flamingo has painted a much larger area. You know, one bucket of Flamingo paint is equal to several buckets of any other paint brand on the market. Flamingo paint is made with superior formulation to give superior durability, superior hiding, superior coverage. Flamingo paint, simply superior. I want you so bad, Alpha Blacker. I want you. I wanna say yes, I can't resist. I want you. Ooh, I want wow. you, Alpha Cracker. I want you so bad. <laughs> Alpha goodness rich in milk and butter in Alpha Cracker. Yummy and deliciously crunchy. Alpha Crackers, simply irresistible. This advert is FD approved. Wins the ultimate energy personality of the year at the seventh edition of your prestigious Ghana Energy Award. Under the theme Ghana's Energy Transition Framework, Sector Institutions has building block for the 2030 to 2040 target. You can nominate yourself or an institution for categories such as CEO of the Year, Energy Investment Impact Award, Energy Signature Award, Endorsement, Validation, Industry Partners, Media Partners, TV3, Ghana Energy Awards, Seven Years of Redefining Excellence. When you have the extra bit of ambition in your heart, you also need extra bit of energy to come through. And for that, Rush Energy is the perfect boost to get over the line. Created in the USA and proudly made in Ghana. Thanks to the unique formula, you have the power of ginseng. The benefit of vitamins and all the energy of inositol, taurine and caffeine. Anytime you need to go beyond, Rush Energy will help you get there. Everybody knows Acrobato. And if you know Acrobato, it means you know M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. M Punch Homeopathy Clinic is my pillar. Let's hear what others are saying about M Punch Homeopathy Clinic. Who will be careful M Punch Wana? And everything yourself. Be me no a juju. Eda ho a won tumi nanti. And then you call end point. Oma me no mura. And then why di a won tumi a sorry nanti. That's end point for you. Oma kwa bato. Hello. Hey, what you want? Okay. A free bra. What di end point? What does it? I'm a call you no. Me just to say my name, go ye. And first one, my name is Nina. And I'm a Gina Sabema. Now, when you be here for the, the hard thing, you know, you are a You heard everything. I have secret. M point is my secret. M point from your party clinic. I'm free.
Artificial intelligence, creativity and sustainability. Join this year's Africa Rising Six, brought to you by the International Advertising Association IAA at the Kempinski Hotel Gold Coast City as we uncover the power of building future-ready brands on 5th and 6th September. Speaker Sasan Saidi, World Chairman and President, International Advertising Association, Andrew Techiapia, Co-Founder and MD, ZPay, Letepu Machaba, Independent Business Leader, Former Vice President of Home Care, Unilever, Ivan Moroki, CEO Kanta South Africa, Guy Parker, Chief Executive, Advertising Standards Authority, United Kingdom, Steve Papaiko, CEO, Extreme Ideas, Sami Awuku, Director General, National Lottery Authority, and many more. This conference is sponsored by Margins Group, ZPay, Google, MTN, Goyle and NLA, Media Partners, CNN, Media General, Graphic Communication Group. Register now at www.africarising.iaaglobal.org for more information or contact Nanajwa on 0242-528-431 or the AAG Secretariat 0244-440477. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, the minority members of parliament have postponed their planned Occupy Bank of Ghana protests slated for tomorrow, but insist on using the same routes that have become a subject of dispute. What does it really mean with respect to the outcome of the injunction case? We're finding out shortly. Um, on this, but there were a number of developments in court earlier today, and uh, Mama Yariga, who is a member of parliament for the Boko Central constituency, he also issued a statement for and on behalf of the minority chief whip about this particular issue. He's joining us on Zoom. Thank you so much, Mama Yariga, for your time here on Ghana tonight. So you said you are insisting on using the same route, which is a subject of, of this injunction? changed uh, as I indicated uh, today the route has not changed right we still stand by our route the only thing that has changed is the date uh, as uh, announced by our leader um, Honorable to Forson the new date will be um, the 12th of uh, September and uh, uh, the route will remain the same. See, you're saying the routes will remain the same. But I'm looking at things this way. The route is the main issue of this particular injunction, is it not? And the um, reason why uh, you were in court today. Not giving any decision on the, on the route. So, so long as we are concerned, that remains... Uh, the route that we proposed, unless uh, we go to court and then the court has some issue with the route that we have proposed. Today, it was about uh, the preliminary objection that we raised as to the capacity of uh, the police service to come in the form that they came to try and restrain us. And it is that matter that the court said they will rule on on Friday. And uh, I believe after they ruled on that on Friday, um, the court will then hear the substantive issue of whether or not we can uh, march mm. on mm. the 12th uh, on the, using the route that we, we proposed. So basically, so far as we are concerned, the route has not changed until the court says otherwise. I see. So 
Is the route subject to change depending on the outcome of the court hearing on this injunction on Friday or regardless of the outcome of the court's decision on this particular case, you are still going to stick to the roots as earlier communicated? Oh, no. I mean, we are not abiding citizens. This is, uh, these are members of parliament. We make the law. We, we, we uh, cannot be in the forefront of saying that we will not comply with any court decision. But we're saying that we are very confident that a court will not uh, revise the route because there's really nothing wrong with the route. It's just the police that are trying to engage in fear-mongering, uh, intimidatory tactics, uh, telling people that there's, there's a fear that there will be a military coup and it is a demonstration that will you know, uh, serve as a basis for a military coup. That's just a fear-mongering. That's a very intimidatory tactics that they are using. And the rest of us cannot allow the police, you know, to fail to perform their basic responsibilities and use threats of uh, military coup as uh, the reason why uh, we should allow them not to perform their basic response. In the past, we have marched along the same routes with the same police providing us with uh, their support. And the marches have been very peaceful and very successful. And so, you know, you can't tell us that today you have lost that capacity to, to be able to police us to, to march along the same routes. And, and so we should not, you know, uh, 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 yield to their intimidatory tactics. I see. You, you raise concern about the police application to injunct the process over the security concerns. And the fundamental issue you raise uh, by your lawyers earlier today was about Article 88.5 of the 1992 Constitution and, and questioning the police's capacity in issuing this particular injunction or, as it were, applying for the injunction on your planned protest. Now, the police in their response is saying this is something they've been doing, there's precedence, they've been doing this all the while. So did, did the judge really take into consideration all of this um, earlier today in, in the court ruling? Well, I mean, the, the issue really is that in the past, the police have always come to court um, yeah. uh, to, to, to try and uh, restrain us. And today we, 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 we thought to point it out to them that all that they have been doing in the past has been wrong. And uh, they argued that, oh, but we've always come to court this way. But we said, well, the fact that you've been doing the wrong thing every day doesn't mean that one day we shouldn't point it out to you that you are wrong. And today is the day when we took a decision that we needed to let them know that the mechanism by which they have always come to court to restrain us from carrying out demonstration is wrong. And the judge was <laughs> clearly minded to to think through it because uh, it has never been raised and this is the first time that it is being raised that they really had no capacity to come and be uh, stopping us in the name of they could have come in the name of the igp but not in the name of the republic if they are coming in the name of the republic then it should be the attorney general himself or his uh, staff or somebody that he has uh, properly authorized to come and stop us in the name of the republic but they could have come in the name of the igp Hmm. Very interesting development in court today. So over the period, this capacity of the police to institute the action on their own is what the court has ruled on now, that they cannot do this. Mama Ma Yarga, thank you very much for your time here on Ghana tonight. I appreciate you staying up to connect with us. And um, we'll wait to see what the court ruling on the substantive matter, which is the injunction on your planned route will be on Friday. Thank you very much for staying with us here on Ghana Tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, we do appreciate your company. Join us same time tomorrow. I am Alfred Kansi. Have a good night. Ghana Tonight is brought to you by Flamingo Paint. Superior durability. Superior hiding. Superior coverage. Simply superior.